Anyway, does, so before we get started, does anybody know where the famous revolutionary propagandist Thomas Paine is buried? Uh, this will come as no surprise to at least one of you. Nobody does. Uh, he died, and he was in kind of bad odor at that time for a number of reasons, but he, he had been very critical of Washington, and he sort of like on the outs with a lot of people. And he, was, he had left instructions that he wanted to be buried in this uh, Quaker cemetery, uh, but they wouldn't have him, so he was buried somewhere else. And then later on, one of his sort of partisans decided that he was going to take his remains back to England and they were going to have this heroic burial for him. So they had him dug up and he went back to England, but he couldn't get it done for something. Like he couldn't get money for the monument, something like this. I remember I was watching this lecture about it. I can't remember the exact story. But in any case, he kept what was left of, of pain in a box in his <laughs> attic. And then, he, and then he died. And his possessions were sort of whatever. And now nobody knows. About every 20 years or so, somebody's like, yeah, I think we found the, no, no, it's not Thomas Paine. <laughs> Poor old guy. So his remains were lost? Yeah, we have, nobody knows where, where Thomas Paine went. These lecture series, I, I try and sort of do them on things that I'm interested in learning something about. When I sort of came around to do uh, American Revolution, or as, as I was sort of talking about it with people I knew, I was reminded of sort of how much and how little like my generation was taught about, about the American Revolution. So doing this sort of preparation for these lectures has been a real sort of opportunity for me to, to read some books and learn some things. Just as a sort of precursor to, uh, to getting down to serious business, the last time I played a kind of uh, one of these uh, little schoolhouse rock things, and I've, uh, I've got one that's relevant here, so we'll just hopefully see if the uh, sound system here will make it happen. As your body grows big, Washington and the French beat Cornwallis surrendered, and finally we had one. 
if you had grown up in the 1970s, um, you would have in the early 1980s, you would have seen this on Saturday morning TV probably like at least once a week. It gets a lot of things right. The last one was a little hard on George III. George III was no more like no worse or more venial than than uh, than most European aristocrats at the time. And it's not like we we try and sort of paint this picture of like the virtuous Americans versus the sort of lax, lazy, whatever, which is which is not exactly true, although not entirely false either. So, how did we get to the point that <clears throat> we're in a shooting war with the British? The larger order cause, in a, in a certain sense, is the, the French and Indian War, which is the kind of North American version of the Seven Years' War going on between, the Seven Years' War is really 1756 to 1763, but the French and Indian War gets going a little earlier. And, and basically what this is is a colonial war, <coughs> or excuse me, a war for colonial possessions between two of the three major uh, North American powers, Great Britain and France. The, the, the Spanish were not directly involved at this point. They were reaping so much money from South America, although they were, the silver mines were winding down a little by that point, I guess. Anyway, so uh, the English essentially come out on top in the, in, uh, in the Seven Years' War and get sort of all of the French possessions east of the Mississippi and into Canada. And sort of, uh, it's at this point that things all start going wrong. Now, up until this point, the American colonies have been a kind of normal sort of colonial enterprise. That is to say, you come up with some form of charter, people go over, they form towns, and they function in a, in a mercantilist system. That is to say, the whole economic order of society was geared toward getting more money for Britain. That was the kind of rise in debt of the whole operation. Like Adam Smith talked about the human propensity to truck and barter, which is not, I think anthropologists have, have debunked a lot of that in the kind of longer scheme, but uh, the, the sort of free market is a very late uh, comer to European society. And in this time still, under the mercantilist system, uh, you're very restricted in to whom you can sell and under what circumstances. If you're an American colonist, or if you're a colonist in North America, you're not allowed to just sell your stuff to whoever you want you have to sell it to the sort of the central country and then they can decide to trade with, with other places. And you can't sell it to other colonies too. So there are very rich British colonies down in the Caribbean, the Sugar Islands, uh, many of which that they've heisted from France. Uh, those are really where the money is. I mean, one of my uh, US history professors in college uh, joked that it was sort of all for the, one of the reasons that, that there was sort of so much freedom in the kind of northern part of, of the eastern seaboard was that they didn't really produce anything that anybody wanted. Uh, so that, which is not exactly true, but, but it's one of those things that's kind of, that, that to which there is a grain of truth. Um, so the, the French and Indian War, <coughs> which is fought by Great Britain to protect these North American colonists and to protect their economic interests, is fabulously expensive. And when it's over, the British Parliament decides, well, we need to try and recoup some of this money. Now, you know, we talked last time, or I talked last time about, you know, there's the famous slogan, no taxation without representation. And let's be clear, as I said before, and I think this is one of my better lines, so I'm just going to re repeat it. Nobody likes taxation with representation. Uh, so it's not surprising that the colonists, when the uh, British Parliament started putting a lot of export duties on, on, uh, on their trade, started saying, hey, wait a minute. Now, of course, they had no represent representatives in Parliament that they voted for. But neither did about 90% of people living in Great Britain. The, the franchise, the, only about 10% of people got to vote. You had to be male and an adult, and you had to own a certain amount of property. Just your average person didn't really start getting the vote until the reform bills of the 1830s and the 1840s. So a, very, a relatively small proportion of the people actually got to vote in any case. So there was what was called like virtual representation which was very unsatisfying to people in Great Britain, much less here. Also, 
Great Britain was at the time uh, a relatively high tax state. The people in the colonies paid relatively little tax. They were probably taxed at about one tenth the rate that people actually in the, the, great, the British metropole were taxed. So the people in Parliament thought, well, <clears throat> this is not an unreasonable thing, right? Like we just spent a lot of money to keep you from speaking French or being scalped. Because of course the, <clears throat> the, the French sort of uh, colonization process was slightly different and they managed to kind of get the, the native people in on their side. Because the native, like the, one of the things about the, the, the British colonists was that they kept like, like multiplying and trying to move inland. The French were more sort of interested in in trapping and, and, and resource exploitation of that kind. So, but in any case, so there's a series of, uh, of taxes and duties. The Stamp Act of 1765 is important for two reasons. First of all, okay, so the Stamp Act is important because what the British government said was, uh, if you're going to publish a newspaper or get a diploma or have a will or do any sort of legal document, it has to be done on this special stamp paper and you have to pay for, for that especially. And this was the first time that there was actually an internal tax inside the colonies. Prior to this point, the taxation had all been import and export duties. So, and, and, and let's remember too, and this is a, a worthwhile thing to remember that in the first instance, who pays the duty? The importer pays it. So if they wanted tea, which they did not grow there, that tea, which much of which was grown in India, would go where first? To Britain then go to the United States where a tax would have to be paid for it to enter. And who would pay the tax? The people bringing it, the people importing it. Um, so that was very upsetting to people. But the Stamp Act is, it's one of these really imp very important moments, and we're going to get to the war in a second here, sorry, but I just want to sort of give the, the precursor for this, which is that the Stamp Act affected who? Uh, journalists. Because if you're a newspaper, you know, you have to pay the tax. Uh, uh, merchants, uh, scholars, why? Because if you're going to be handing out diplomas, once again. So it, it affected the people who were sort of most able to grouse publicly about it. And it brought, the, col the colonies had been very fractious. They very much kind of dis didn't trust each other and they were in a lot of respects very different, they were almost really like different countries. But the Stamp Act of 1765 really pushed them together in a lot of ways. Um, and it was very surprising. So the, the British keep doing, there's a whole sort of long litany of things that goes on, but the British keep sort of like changing. They keep saying, well, you know, okay, so we're not going to have the Stamp Act anymore, but we're going to have these other duties. And like hopefully these will be less obnoxious to you. But by this point, what the colonists were a lot, what a lot of them were worried about was the principle that the British seemed to be, the British monarchy seemed to be asserting, which was that we have the right to just do these things unilaterally. And if that's the case, then we're really just slaves. This seemed very ironic to some people, many of whom were actual slaves. Um, like the, the condition of, being a wealthy merchant who has to pay taxes and the condition of someone who is a chattel slave on some plantation in South Carolina, it's very different. Um, and this was actually pointed out by some people, the, the loyalists, especially during the war, like the, you know, the Virginians would be out there like, yes, we must have liberty. And the loyalists down there would be like, well, okay, but you don't, like liberty seems to only apply to certain kinds of people and not others, like what's that all about? But, um, so there's a process of ramping up of, of tensions. Uh, they, because of uh, the sort of uh, uh, real unrest that's going on in Boston, the British insert troops there, which only makes the matter worse. Because once again, you know, the British already have troops in North America. And uh, what the North Americans are paying in taxes only really covers about a third of what it costs to keep the troops there. And the British think to themselves, well, the parliament, I mean, if you read the parliamentary debates, there's a lot of them are thinking and saying, we're really keeping some very bad things at bay from you. Why are you so grumpy about coughing up some of the money that it's, that it's costing to do it? But from the, from the colonist perspective, the situation was, well, you got troops here, right? And 
like they could just as easily be repressing us, and they kind of are. So the Boston Massacre happens, uh, this is a sort of event that happens in 1770, uh, in which there's a kind of, there's very sort of growing tension between the troops and the, and the locals. There's a lot of uh, uh, threats being thrown back and forth. There's a lot of abuse being thrown back and forth. And there ends up a sort of confrontation between troops and some people in town in which shooting starts, so bad at actual numbers, uh, in which five people, you know, I was right. I was going to say five people were killed, and I should just go with my gut. Five people are killed. Uh, the soldiers go on trial for shooting down unarmed civilians. I mean, they're getting throw balls, throw balls, snowballs thrown at them. And who defends them? John Adams does. And he gets all but two of them acquitted. The other two get their thumbs branded. I don't know. I mean, it seems bad, right? Sure, but by the standards of what could happen to you in the British legal system, I mean, like, hanging was the penalty for something like 150 different offenses in the British legal system. So just getting your thumb branded probably seems like, yeah, getting off reasonably easy, I guess. The level of tension is, 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 is considerable. And once again, the, 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 the parliament passes this Tea Act in 1773. And once again, this is a duty on tea. And, the par and it's not a very heavy duty. But once again, the, the colonists say, we're not having it. And so <clears throat> a bunch of them, in December of 1773, uh, dress up like in his, apparently they didn't dress up very, I mean, they like put on blankets and kind of put some like, like soot on their faces, and went onto these boats and started like chucking chests full of tea overboard. They ended up like throwing about 10,000 pounds worth of, worth of tea into the harbor. And if you're wondering how much that is, probably less than, you know, 30 pounds would be uh, a normal income for a person for a year. Um, so that's a lot of money. Uh, they were apparently very polite about it. The parliament uh, in 1774, uh, of course, it takes a while for things to kind of percolate because it takes several weeks to get back and forth across the Atlantic. Uh, institutes what's what are called the intolerable acts that saying that Boston is going to be the harbor is going to be blockaded, that that uh, the colonial uh, that the Boston or that the uh, Massachusetts uh, charter is going to be rescinded and they're going to be under direct rule from Britain, uh, and that all of this is going to last until they pay off the money, and this is what really kicks things off. At the same time, uh, the other colonies start organizing. They, uh, the first Continental Congress meets in Philadelphia in the Carpenters Hall in seven, September 1774. It features 12 of the 13 colonies. Does anyone know which colony was not there? Georgia, it was, there was so, there was Georgia, there was heavy loyalist support in Georgia, and it was, uh, oddly enough, because I, as I recall, it was a form of penal colony, but in any case, um, all the other colonies were represented there. But as they start having these debates, or, there's a real difference of opinion. Are we just trying to sort of get a redress of grievances, or have we got to the point where we have to cut the tie here? Um, and they don't quite work the whole thing uh, work the whole thing out at that point. You get at this point too in 1775, Patrick Henry uh, addressing the, the Virginia House of Burgesses and saying, I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. So you're saying, I mean, and when you say that out loud and in public, uh, that's a very profound moment because the, the, the British authorities do not take very kindly to uh, rebellion, and they tend to take a very sort of hard stance on it. So if you're going to come out and say that, that's a very public upping of the, of the ante. In April of 1775, uh, the British become aware, the British commanders in Boston become aware that there is a, a cache of arms at, held at Concord, uh, which is just outside of, uh, it's kind of out west of Boston. and. Um, they decide that they're going to go out there and sort it out. Oh, but this is a, a, a colonial cartoon. This is the doctor, America, swallowing the bitter draft. And here's America sort of with her breasts being held down. And the, the, uh, the British, the port bill, which was the one that shut down Boston Harbor, is sort of sticking out of his pocket. And he's like pouring tea down poor old America's throat. At this point, the uh, colonial militias had started to form. There were a lot of veterans of the French and Indian Wars around. There were a lot of people who just thought, 
you know, things have gone too far. And if they're going to have soldiers here, we need to have soldiers too. So they decide that, uh, that they're going to go destroy this, this arms cache. And in fact, the, the colonials had sort of found out that this was likely to happen. And this is where you get the, the sort of midnight ride of Paul Revere. Revere and another, and another fellow sort of uh, post up uh, on the other side of Boston Harbor. Uh, looking for a signal from the Old North Church to know whether they're going to come across Charlestown Neck by land or come straight across the harbor by sea um, <clears throat> and go out to Concord. By the time the, they got going, like so many people knew about it that most of the arms and stuff had actually been moved out of Concord. Um, so they march out there. They get to Concord and apparently they're, you know, reasonably pleasant about things so that the search took so long that all the rest, I mean, they found some stuff, but most of the rest of it was taken to other places. Um, they paid for all the food and drink, apparently, according to one thing that I read. Um, but the first place that they get to before they get to Concord is Lexington. The Minutemen at Lexington have had scouts out, and the Minutemen get out on the green and re get ready to face the British. And there's a kind of a standoff that happens at about 7.30 or 8 in the morning. And nobody knows exactly who fired the first shot, but uh, the British fired a, like, a concentrated blast into the Minutemen uh, and then charged them with bayonets. Only eight of them were actually killed. Part of this has to do with the, the, the accuracy of the smoothbore musket, which uh, was lethal at anything up to about 300 yards, but your chances of hitting anything even at distances of less than 20 feet was relatively limited. <laughs> uh, there's, this, there's, a, there's a sort of story that I read about, about one uh, British soldier who was going to be executed for for desertion, he deserted, they caught him, they gave him a lot of lashes. He deserted again, they caught him, they were gonna execute him. And they took him out to a beach outside of Boston, and they stood about 10 feet away, the firing squad, and shot at him, and didn't kill him. <laughs> so then someone else came up and sort of finished him off. But, but the, the smoothbore musket is a spectacularly inaccurate weapon. It wasn't, you know, at this time they had rudimentary uh, rifled uh, weapons, but they were very, like, it takes a while to load a smoothbore musket. You'll see the guys standing there like, geez. But the, the rifle one, you had to kind of squelch the ball down in there. It took a longer time. It wasn't for a while until they came up with the breech loader that, I mean, the breech loader is, is much, much later, but then you can have a rifled bullet, yada, yada, yada. So the Minutemen, after the sort of beginning of this, somebody said to the guy who was commanding the, the Minutemen, Maybe we should like take cover. There's like fences over here. The guy had the, the guy who was commanding the, the Minutemen at Lexington uh, had tuberculosis, which eventually killed him. And um, <clears throat> apparently that, so he was less concerned, I guess, about getting undercover. And the Minutemen are kind of dispersed there. Uh, and then the British take a, a, a less wise decision. So here's Boston, and they come across Boston Harbor instead of going up Charlestown Neck. And um, they come out here to Lexington, uh, which is there. And then they decide to head to Concord. And they go to Concord. They sort of search the place. And then they head out west of Concord and get to the Old North Bridge. By this time, the country is really up. And uh, whereas they'd only met you know, a couple of hundred Minutemen when they got to Lexington, there's almost a 1,000 colonial uh, fighters who've managed to get in from all the surrounding towns. And they get to the bridge and suddenly realize that they've got a real fight on their hands. So there's a shootout. Once again, it's not one of these, it's one of these things where nobody knows who fired the first shot, um, although it's often it's referred to in the Emerson poem of the 1830s as the shot heard around the world. Um, <clears throat> but the British pretty soon realize that they're kind of overmatched and they need to go. So fortunately, uh, they had sent back to Boston for reinforcements. And they end up getting joined by about another 1,000 soldiers, which is all for the best, because then, in the 18 or so miles that it takes them to march back to Boston, they learn something about, well, they learn two things about the, the colonial troops. One is that uh, they're not just walk over. I mean, there had been this sort of idea that the first time the British opened fire that the colonials would all scatter and the problem would be taken care of. And that turned out really not to be the case. But also, it turns out that they were not playing by the sort of standard rules of warfare where you stand up in a line. And you, I mean, part of the reason you did this was to mass your fire. But they're hiding behind rocks and fences and all kinds of stuff. And the British keep having to stop 
and turn around and they're taking casualties all the way back down to all the way back down to, to Boston. Um, they end up taking about 270 uh, uh, casualties in total, which is about, you know, they had about 1,700, so that's, that's not a huge number, but it's a noticeable number. I think there are about 90 or 100 casualties among the colonists as well. So then the, the British decide that they're going to uh, take some stiffer measures, and the, but also the, uh, the colonial army then invests the city of Boston. At a certain point, they decide that they're going to post up on a hill here on the Charlestown Peninsula, uh, much to the chagrin of the British. Uh, those of you who've, who've read a little about this will know that uh, Breed's Hill was where it really, the action really happened. Bunker Hill is slightly behind it. Uh, but they get on there and they build uh, fortifications now, th there's been kind of low-intensity warfare, if you want to call it. This is not an island. And they managed at one point to convince uh, one of the British naval captains to sail into this channel behind Noddle Island, which immediately resulted in his boat getting grounded. And then the colonists just jumped it and burned it. Um, so there's a kind of long process of, of kind of low-intensity warfare all the way around from the Dorchester Peninsula down here all the way around to the, to the north end. And, um, or Chelsea, I guess, is what, really what's over here. So they, they post up here, and the British decide, for reasons that, that only the people involved will really know, that what they need to do is stage a frontal attack on, uh, on Bunker Hill. So eventually, they manage to land. Now, so this is Charlestown right here. And the first thing that happens is British naval guns just absolutely obliterate the town of Charlestown. Um, and then. The British land 2,300 troops and start marching straight up the front of Breed's Hill, where the colonists have spent all day digging entrenchments. And you know, when you, those of you who've been in the army will know that when you have that kind of motivation, uh, you can really do some real entrenching in the space of eight or nine hours. Um, and this is, uh, I meant to show you this first, I'll just sort of, this is a series of engravings that were done. This is the sort of march up to Lexington. This is the sort of shootout at the Old North Bridge. The Old North, I always thought the Old North Bridge was covered, but it wasn't. This is a, this is a, the Old North Bridge was sort of rebuilt, but that's, it's, that's, it was, it was sort of like redone in the same style. And then this is the British kind of trying to move back, and you can kind of see the colonists here opening fire on them and everything on fire, and it's not very nice. And so this is the sort of map of the, of the, uh, of the way out there. So here, once again, we have, uh, this is Boston. There's a lot of like mud flats now. And this is the Charlestown Peninsula. This, you know, is basically where kind of Logan is now. So the British attack Breed's Hill, where the, the uh, Prescott and the, the Colonials are entrenched. And, you know, there's this sort of famous moment. I mean, Prescott says, may possibly have said, who knows. It would not have been out of character to say, don't don't shoot until you see the whites of their eyes. Why? Because our weapons are so horribly inaccurate that we'd like to fire them with some chance of actually hitting what we're shooting at. And also, conveniently, um, here's another sort of more uh, extensive map that you can see here is Breed's Hill, that they basically march up in a line. Uh, and there's a kind of a slog. The British eventually end up clearing uh, Breeds Hill, but they end up taking about 400 casualties doing it out of a force of, out of a force of 2,300. They end up taking about 450 so casualties. So it's a kind of a pyrrhic victory for them, and that, if you want to know, is the kind of story of the war writ large. The British really, in a lot of respects, won most of the engagements that they took part in, but they won them at such cost that eventually they could not maintain uh, the war effort, which once again was absolutely fabulously expensive. So you can see these are some of the British warships around. We know roughly where they were. We have a lot of oral history of. Uh, now this is all filled in. Like this is all filled in, and this is where Somerville is. Somerville used to be referred to as Charlestown beyond the neck. Uh, I know from having lived there. So even after Bunker Hill, it's still, the die is still not cast. There's been some, some real exchanges. They set up a, a kind of a peace conference to see if Admiral Howe, 
who's the sort of main British commander, really wants to see if maybe we can just, can we just talk about this, right? Okay, you shot some of us, we've shot some of you, we've both showed that we're serious, we're all British, maybe we can sort this out. So you see here, there's Admiral Howe, there's uh, Benjamin Franklin, there's John Adams, and I think that's Rutledge behind them. Um, but they get together and they, it becomes clear very quickly that, uh, that neither side is going to sort of concede. And it's actually a relatively cordial meeting. I mean, uh, uh, Franklin had been ba based in, in England for a long time, in London for a long time, and was very sympathetic you know, he, to, to British society. But he was very frustrated with the fact that they kept doing these things that were annoying people and stirring them up. So you can see four days after the conference breaks up, uh, Howe seizes New York City. New York City was very loyalist and had that reputation throughout the war. This was very upsetting to Hamil uh, Alexander Hamilton, who was, a, who was a real New York guy. They send 6,000 men to capture Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, November uh, 1776, the Continental Congress sees the writing on the wall and uh, heads out into New Jersey because they think that they're uh, they're next. So Washington had been appointed by the Continental Congress to be the leader of the army. Why? Uh, he was, he had fought in the French and Indian War, actually with some distinction. He was a well-known Virginia planter. So he had military experience. He had the kind of leadership qualities. He was Virginian and they wanted someone from outside of the New England North Atlantic region to be the commander because once again, what they're trying to do is put together an entity that will kind of hang together. So they wanted a southerner uh, to do it, to convince the northerners that the southerners were in too. And so there's, there's essentially three parts to the uh, American Revolution. There's the northern part that goes on mostly in New York, partly in Massachusetts, partly in, in other parts of New England. New York, New Jersey. There's the southern part that goes on mostly in the Carolinas. And then there's the French part. And that, that is essentially, in a way, what ends up deciding it. Washington spends a lot of this time uh, worrying about his army collapsing. These guys are on six-month enlistments, and they're all about to, they started in the summer, so they're all about to expire. So he knows that he needs to, <coughs> he needs a big something to keep the momentum going. So on December, on, on Christmas uh, 1776, he famously crosses the Delaware to surprise uh, British mercenary troops. They're Hessians. They're from Hesse, the German state of Hesse. The, the British, once again, their army has never been very big. British never were a great land power. They were always much more of a sea power. So they've hired German mercenaries. This is another thing that's really annoying to the colonists. They've sent these German mercenaries over. Because even at this point, they think, well, Germans like absolutism, no democracy, very terrible. They're sending these foreigners in here to sort of police us. So nobody liked the Hessians. Uh, the Hessians probably weren't any worse than anyone else. But he manages to, uh, to capture Trenton, taking about 900 Hessian mercenaries prisoner and then manages to fight off the British sort of counterattack and hold on uh, to Trenton into uh, the beginning of 1777, at which point uh, he retreats to uh, Morristown, New Jersey, where he spends the winter. Now, this is <coughs> in the Northern theater, this is war very much on the European model, which is that there's a kind of campaign season. You don't really want to campaign during the winter if you can avoid it. There isn't a lot of food around, number one. That's the big one. An army marches on its stomach is a famous sort of old saw about how these things work. And so what both armies want to do for the real nasty part of the winter is get into some quarters somewhere where they won't freeze to death, where they can have a sort of central place where they can bring food in. Um, and so Morristown is not the greatest sort of place. But <coughs> in, in, in the sort of crossing of the Delaware, He's regenerated the morale in the colonial army. And he's convinced a lot of the people, maybe we're in this fight for the long run, right? Maybe we've got a real shot here. And if it's going to be, 
we're going to cut the cord here. You need to believe, if, if you're going to take part in that right, that there's some chance that this thing is going to go right and that you're not going to sacrifice yourself to end up at the, you know, at the short end of a rope. The British, too, when they do take prisoners, tend to put them on these series of boats in uh, New York Harbor, which are incredibly nasty because, once again, they don't view the colonial soldiers as soldiers. They view them as rebels. And, you know, you can, it's a sort of well-established principle in the laws of war. Soldiers get a certain kind of treatment. Uh, rebels, you can pretty much do as you like. This is uh, Emanuel Leutz's famous uh, picture of Washington crossing the Delaware. It's unrealistic for a couple of reasons. One is they didn't use these sorts of high-sided boats. Number two, I, anybody with a lick of sense does not stand up in a boat <laughs> in the middle of winter, in the middle of a New Jersey winter, rolling around on the Delaware. This is George Caleb Harris's painting. It's dated 1856 to 1871. I hardly think it took him 15 years to paint it. It gets some things right, so this is the right kind of boat. Get some things wrong. If Washington wasn't standing up, he sure as heck wasn't riding his horse. Uh, but two, let's remember, you know, so this is, the images that we see of the war are almost invariably from much later on, done by people who weren't there and only have the vaguest idea of what really happened. And I, you know, I, I seriously don't think that George Kaler Harris actually thought that that Washington was sitting there on his horse. He was just kind of trying to make a point, I think, about Washington, which is how the iconography of paintings like this works, right? What you're trying to make, the point is, you know, that Washington, here he is, he's this commanding president. How commanding is he? He can sit on his horse in the middle of a barge, the Delaware River. The British end up sort of retreating into Canada, and then they have this idea that what they're going to do is they're going to come down uh, the kind of Champlain, St. George, Hudson route into uh, upstate New York. They're led by Johnny Burgoyne. Burgoyne is this, one of these really fascinating characters from the war. He was a, a kind of a bon vivant. He wrote plays and poetry. He, was, uh, he wasn't much of a general. Um, and that's the way, you know, this, I'm just going to, as a sort of side note, there's, uh, there's a really great book about, this is, I know, a much different topic, but a book called, about the, the charge of the light brigade called The Reason Why. Uh, and one of the sort of things that you learn from reading this book is how easy it was to become sort of a command grade officer in the British Army, even though you were a rank incompetent. And, and this sort of thing, it, people kept getting, you know, if you, if you read sort of into the history of the American Revolution, British officers are constantly sort of getting cashiered because it turns out that, you know, the fact that you were the son of the Earl of East whatever doesn't necessarily mean that you know anything about about leading troops into battle or strategy or what have you. He captures Fort Ticonderoga, then he moves down Lake Champlain, captures Fort Ticonderoga on the 27th of June, uh, and then moves into the area of Saratoga where uh, he meets uh, the colonial army under the command of General Horatio Gates. Gates was from a very prominent New York family. Uh, there had been a lot of uh, support for him to be the commander of the colonial army. They didn't make him the commander, and, and the reason why was, at the time, we want somebody sort of, why they picked the vice presidential candidate from some far off place. We need, you know, we need someone to balance the ticket. So, but Gates was, was well enough known that he, that he ends up uh, commanding the troops. They end up fighting uh, one battle at a place called Freeman's Farm, which is right about there which they end up pushing the British back. The British end up then uh, bunkering down sort of further uh, on Bemis Heights. There's a second battle which is fought on the 7th of October and which is won uh, in no small measure because of a charge led by Benedict Arnold, uh, who at that point was a very uh, uh, up-and-coming young officer. Uh, later, Arnold would be involved in a scheme to... Arnold always needed money, I think, and was involved in a sort of scheme to, to, to let the British into the kind of fortifications around West Point. He ended up defecting. And those of you who, there's a, there's a very famous book about this, but he ended up, his contact was a guy named John Andre. Andre was captured and later hanged. Uh, and it was really unfortunate because, and, I mean, Andre was hanged as a spy. And that's, once again, that's the standard laws of war at those times. If you were going to be, 
uh, wandering around trying to suborn the officers of the other army, this was the thing that was likely to happen to you if, if you got caught. But <coughs> uh, Arnold managed to, uh, uh, he was later put in charge of uh, some of the British troops in the Carolinas uh, and then, you know, died of old age or, or was not executed. At the same time, so the battle at Bemis Heights, which is the sort of second battle of Saratoga, they lose. Moreover, they, so uh, Burgoyne is kind of bunkered in there. Uh, he's had Native American allies who have kind of deserted him. More of his troops now start uh, deciding that they'd rather do something else. He's having, um, I keep wanting to say defection, but that's not the word that I'm really looking for. Desertion, Desertion thank you for clarifying that for me. And finally, he surrenders in October of 1777. And this is really, the victories at Saratoga are arguably the real game-changing victories for the American cause. Because it's at this point that European powers start to take notice. The French have a long-running beef, particularly the Comte de Vergen, who's the, the French foreign minister, absolutely abhors the British. And he sees this and starts thinking, well, you know, they took Quebec from us, and they took, they took Martinique, they took the Sugar Islands. Wouldn't it be nice to get back at them by any means necessary? And so, once again, another thing that happens in the course of this uh, struggle in North America is uh, war then manages to break out between the, the British and the French, who hate them, uh, for the, the French and Indian War, and for the Seven Years' War that had been going on sort of in parallel fashion on the European continent. And the Spanish, who not incorrectly assume that the British uh, would like to take Spanish possessions in North America, and also just see another colonial power and think good news for us is bad news for them, or bad news for them is good news for us, and the Dutch. So once again, three of the four sort of major colonial powers, the only one who didn't take part in this, the whole affair really was the Portuguese. Um, and you get a sort of, the Seven Years' War was like the First World War. It happened, in, it happened across Europe. And you get a kind of second helping of this. There are battles as far away as India, where the French who've kind of been pushed out of uh, the possessions they had in, in southern India by the, by the India Company, decide that they're going to now try and, and, and write the battle, or write the, write the balance. Washington at this point is sort of jousting with British troops through uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey. There's a battle at a place called Pally Tavern, uh, which resulted in, in massacre of prisoners of war uh, at the end. This was a fairly common thing, especially for the British, the, but both sides were guilty of of prisoner killing. Let's just be clear too, prisoner killing happens in pr pretty much every war. Like when you get people like jacked up enough to kill each other, it's the kind of thing that even in the best ordered armies, some of it happens sometimes. But uh, the defeat of Washington's defeat at Pelly Tavern, once again, it's not a very costly defeat for Washington, but it's one that forces him away from Philadelphia. And the British then move in and occupy uh, Philadelphia. Uh, Washington's quarters, Washington's army ends up in winter quarters at Valley Forge, Pennsyl Pennsylvania. This is sort of uh, a sort of famous kind of low point. Uh, the Continental Army is down to about 6,000. They are very low on supplies. They're very low on powder. They're very low on uh, ammunition generally. They're helped in this moment by a number of uh, sort of foreign imports. Most famously, uh, the Marquis de Lafayette. Now, once again, or not once again, but you may wonder like why young French aristocrat wants to come over and do this. But of course it makes a lot of sense because the, the way to get advancement in any European army is to have combat experience. And who are you going to fight but the British? So if you're the Marquis de Lafayette, and also the Marquis de Lafayette has some fairly liberal tendencies as will be shown in the French Revolution when he uh, tries very hard to convince Louis the Sixteenth to to just sort of like make some concessions. Uh, ultimately, he's unsuccessful. 
Uh, Lafayette, there was a sort of set around Washington. Uh, Washington, called it his, Washington called it his family. Lafayette was one of them. Uh, Alexander Hamilton was another. And they really uh, have to struggle at this point to keep things together. Another thing that sort of helps is uh, the arrival of the German general von Steuben, who introduces Prussian drill and uh, does a sort of very important work uh, reorganizing the colonial army. Now, why is drill important? Well, once again, those of you who've been in the army will know, or in the military will know, that drill is the kind of thing that instills organization and obedience into what were troops who had been experienced in combat, but it helps to get people sort of used to doing things in a, in a specific, organized way so that everybody knows what's happening. Even if you're going to be... The, there's relatively little in the course of this war, like stand up, shoot it out fighting, but there's some. And the, the colonial forces get better and better at it as things go along. And one reason is von Steuben teaches them the sort of Prussian manual of arms. The, the Prussians were famous, somebody once said about Prussia in the, oh, way to go. There's Washington with Lafayette, by the way, at Valley Forge. Um, and, uh, once again, painted in 1906. Prussians in the 18th century, somebody once joked that Prussia, which was the sort of precursor state of the northern part of Germany, uh, was a military camp with a state attached. The, the doctrine of, Prussian, of the Prussian military was uh, men should fear their officers more than they fear the enemy. The, the discipline in the Prussian army was notoriously savage, and it was so harsh, in fact, that uh, the Austrians at one point uh, during the reign of mid 18th century, uh, Frederick, during the reign of Frederick the Great. Uh, when a German historian cannot remember Frederick the Great, you know he's in <laughs> bad shape. But that the, the Austrian army set up receiving posts along the Silesian border for all the people who wanted to desert from the Prussian army. So by this time, in 1778, 1780, the war is becoming internationalized. There's really a stalemate going on they keep sort of fighting battles, but they're indecisive. The Comte de Vergen is sort of getting together uh, representatives of all the other powers that really dislike the British, which is pretty much everybody. The Spanish fight a number of engagements. The Spanish blockade a lot of the, of the uh, uh, British colonial possessions. The French blockade the Sugar Islands. The French attack in India. This is, uh, I just put this in here because it's like a picture of a, of a rocket blowing up a horse. Um, that's, that's from one of the battles in India. While this is going on, there's a sort of separate war that's going on in the Carolinas. There are a lot more loyalists down in that part of the country than there are in most of the northern part. British, having been told, hey, you know, if you come here, there's going to be a sort of groundswell of support. That's always a bad, you know, when somebody's trying to get you to do something that's not a great idea, and they tell you, if you just come here, there'll be a groundswell of support. Things will go great. That's immediately the time you start thinking, well, I'm going to go somewhere other than that, definitely. The British under uh, Cornwallis and Henry Clinton invade uh, Georgia and the Carolinas. They capture Savannah in December of 1778. Uh, they cap capture Charleston, South Carolina in May of 1780. There's a lot of sort of indecisive fighting that goes on. This is the Siege of Charleston. By this time, uh, Gates has been sort of transferred down to run the colonial armies here, and he loses a battle, uh, a spectacular battle uh, in the Carolinas at a place called Camden, which is not Camden, New Jersey, but which is Camden. Loses the sort of confidence of the Continental Congress. This is the second Continental Congress, by the way, the one that started meeting after the, the war was started. And he's replaced by Nathaniel Green. Uh, Green is very energetic and really knows what he's doing. He uh, first engages the British at Cowpens, which, which is a sort of loss, but once again, where the British come off with heavier casualties than they can sustain. Uh, he then fights uh, in uh, the Battle of uh, Guilford Courthouse, I mean, at least part of his army does, in, in March of 1781. Uh, Guilford Courthouse is basically Greensboro, North Carolina now. By this time, the French have really gotten into the fray. Uh, they've sent a fleet under Admiral de Grasse to North America. And uh, the, British, the British have also sent 
part of their fleet into the area. So what you get in the sort of, uh, for those of you who may be sort of less familiar with the geography of Maryland and Virginia, what you get is uh, the fleets facing off around the mouth of the Chesapeake. Uh, Cornwallis, who becomes convinced that Virginia is the area through which colonial, uh, the colonial armies are receiving supplies. So he goes up into Virginia and he goes down the peninsula where Jamestown and where uh, York, the York, the J York James Peninsula. This turns out to be a really terrible idea for reasons that will become clear. Washington at this point has sort of settled matters up in the sort of North Atlantic states and has moved down. Uh, he and uh, the Vicomte de Rochambeau have decided that, that they're going to attack British forces. Uh, and they have uh, organized themselves so that they will get the British fleet or the, the French fleet to show up on the Virginia coast at the same time. Cornwallis digs in at Yorktown, and what he assumes will happen is that he will sort of fight his way out of it, and that the British fleet will destroy the French fleet. There are, in fact, two battles of the Capes in September 1781, but they both take place uh, roughly at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. Here you can see the York James Peninsula. This will be the same place that uh, George McClellan comes to grief during the Civil War, moving in the opposite direction. It's a very constrained place and this, you know, once you get out on this peninsula there's really nowhere to go, especially if you can't, if you don't control the, the seas beyond, which is, which is essentially what happens. This is a, a painting done much later by uh, an artist at the Naval Academy at Annapolis. This, here you can see the French fleet, <coughs> here you can see the British fleet uh, unloading on each other uh, at a distance of about a hundred yards or so. And this is, you know, one of the kind of interesting things about warfare in the 18th century is that it's, it's very much on the same model. So once again, you just line the ships up uh, and shoot at each other. The, the British suffered uh, one ship sunk, five damaged, and I think one had to be scuttled later. French only had sort of one ship. When you say damaged, you mean badly damaged because you're getting shot with cannonballs, so some damage is happening somewhere. But the British are not able to assert sea control over the area east of the James Peninsula, the York James Peninsula, and that is essentially the death sentence for Cornwallis's army. There's a very uh, hairy fight that goes on there. You can see where there, uh, this is where the, this is the French army's here. In the course of this, by the way, those of you who come and see uh, one of the Hamilton talks, I'll rehearse this, but uh, Hamilton was always trying to, like always felt like the war was getting away from him. Like he wanted to get real combat uh, experience. And he actually almost had a sort of break with Washington, who was his great friend. I mean, Washington was a little bit of a, not quite a father figure to him, but a sort of elder figure to him. He was on Washington's staff, and Washington wanted to keep him around because he was very effective. But Hamilton wanted a combat command. And so finally, he, he almost causes this break with Washington. They get in a big argument, and, and Hamilton says, well, I'm just out of here. And, and finally, Washington kind of relents and allows him to take this combat command. And <clears throat> uh, Hamilton leads one of the charges on one of these British redoubts uh, in the, in the, uh, at the edge of Yorktown and kind of makes his bones as a, as a sort of military commander. For, for men in public life, there's a very sort of pronounced importance placed on the ability to lead troops. This is like in sort of Hamilton's later life, he was always kind of like referring back to his military service to show people like, hey, I know how to organize things. I know how to get things done. Like, I know how to have people respect me. And this is why he gets involved in the idiotic duel with Aaron Burr, because they end up sort of questioning. Each this is why dueling happens basically at this time, because you can't have people uh, questioning your manhood publicly. Because if you do, then people will just lose confidence in you. And Hamilton really believed that in the course of this, you know, he kind of thought eventually that it would get worked out. And then they were going up to the place and he got shot. So this is the French army uh, charging the British redoubt. This is Cornwallis's surrender, which must have been intensely humiliating. It's not until November of 1781 that he makes it, he's sort of released. Of course, you, you know, this is, the, this is the sort of old form of war, so you just release the generals. And he gets back to England and just sort of tells the king what's going on. The king is 
There's some talk about, about continuing the fight, but it's pretty clear by this point the British don't have the sort of military wherewithal and or the money to, to, to make this work out. And so there's a long period of Lord North's ministry ends up, ends up falling in 1781. Uh, Lord North had been the sort of like driving force. Now, the, the, if you go through the history of this, it's like, the, it's like the sort of seasons of days of our lives, like British ministries would sort of come and go. But when, ministries, when the North ministry falls, a Whig ministry takes over, and they're a little bit more sort of relaxed in their attitude toward the colonies. The Whigs were more, uh, I, I want to use the word liberal. That's not exactly because liberal and conservative don't quite the difference between Whigs and Tories is not like the difference between Democrats and Republicans. Um, but they're a little uh, more sort of sympathetic to liberal ideas, I guess is the sort of best way of putting it. Uh, the Dutch recognized the United States as, a, as an independent country in April of 1782. And a sort of long negotiation period starts through most of 1782 and then into 1783. Uh, with the British trying to sort of work out what the relationship is now going to be, right? I mean, America is going to be an independent country, but Great Britain still has a lot of colonial possessions, right? They still have Quebec and a lot of Canada. They still have the Sugar Islands in the Caribbean. So uh, it's a very complex, and there's a lot of money involved. Also, too, the, U the United States government is getting hectored by the French, who, who, to whom they owe uh, something like 18 million livres that they've been loaned. Uh, it wasn't like the French were making contributions, like they were loaning us money. They also owe uh, 11 million livres to the Dutch government, who had taken out a loan from the French <laughs> to give to us when nobody would extend us credit. Um, so it's, it's, there's a great deal of pressure on the US on the U.S. negotiating team to get a deal done so that we can get our trade right. Because whatever else is the case, we need to trade with Great Britain. And we need to be able to trade with these other countries. There's a big debate that goes on, and we'll get into this when I talk about the Constitution and the Federalist Papers, between people who think that we should be doing more trade with France, like Thomas Jefferson, uh, and people who think that we should be doing more trade with England, like Alexander Hamilton. People kept calling Alexander Hamilton a sort of crypto-monarchist because Hamilton was not that, still liked the British and their society very much, even though he thought that it was best that the United States be a separate country. But he was very much a proponent of trade with, with, with Britain. And he's very politically conservative, too. I mean, this is a sort of interesting thing about the sort of Hamilton and Jefferson are the two kind of great antagonists of the 1780s and 1790s. And um, Hamilton is a, or Jefferson is a real proponent of French society. He's really fascinated with French society, and especially with the kind of more, what's the word I'm looking for, radical political ideas. And this is funny. Hamilton thinks this is hilarious, and, and not in a good way, because here's Jefferson spouting all this stuff about Rousseau and liberty and whatever, and he's got like a whole parcel of slaves down at Monticello. Um, and Hamilton was not the only person to notice this. Once again, there's a very, like the, the fact that <clears throat> on the one hand there are people talking about liberty this and liberty that. Liberty, you'll notice, by the way, is different than freedom. Mm -hmm. Like freedom, you know, if you use the word, use the word freedom in this area, era, people think you're talking about kind of license. You know, you're free to do whatever you want. That's, liberty is a kind of considered freedom if you, you know, it's the, it's the freedom to do whatever you want, but of course you're a reasonable person and you're a Christian and you'll end up doing right things. Um, this is a really interesting picture. So uh, this is a painting that was being done of the negotiations, <laughs> but the British delegation refused to sit for it. <laughs> it's really bad form, I mean, come on, you lost. Like, you're just going to have to eat some crow here. You can see uh, Hamilton particularly here. Uh, but they, it had to be abandoned because the, the, they, wouldn't, they just wouldn't do it. They finally come up with a treaty. And the, the key things are that the relationship between the United States and Great Britain is going to be regularized. Now, the British don't totally hold to this. And once again, you know, there's a kind of low-level conflict that goes on between 
Great Britain and the United States for another 15 or 20 years, culminating in the War of 1812. The British uh, clearly hold the view for the, in the decade after the end of the American Revolution that this is just, that it might be possible to turn the clock back, right? Um, this turns out to be an idea which never, uh, which never, never turns out for them. Uh, and in fact, they benefit quite handsomely because once again they keep a hold of uh, the Caribbean, which is really where the money is. Like if you wanted to make big bucks uh, in the 18th century, you would buy a sugar plantation. You would never go anywhere near it if you didn't want to die of some horrible fever, but you would buy it, uh, have slaves work to death, own it for five or ten years, and then retire on the enormous quantities of money that you'd made doing it. So the British retain control of that. And they also get a lot of trade benefits. From, their, uh, from the extant trade relationships with the United States. I mean, the fact of the matter is, Britain is the most obvious trading par partner for us, and we're the most obvious trading partner for them. Uh, so we kind of have to, uh, we're, kind of, we're kind of frenemies for, for much of the 19th century for this reason. The British always kind of look down their noses at us uh, until the First World War, in which at which point they kind of went broke. And, but it's not, for, uh, it's not for 10 or 15, 20 years that the simmering conflict between the, the British and, and the United States gets sorted out. Also what has happened, and I, I, I meant to mention this at the point that I was talking about the enormous amounts of money that we owed in loans to the French, a lot of the way that this uh, <coughs> war has been financed has been by bonds being given sort of in lieu of immediate payment to soldiers in the Continental Army. And there's a very extensive trade in those bonds that goes on after the war. As a matter of fact, a number of uh, what people came to call Alexander Hamilton's financial schemes when he was setting up the Bank of the United States involved like what kind of trade was going to be legal in those bonds. Because, you know, say you thought, say you were a holder of, of, of one of these instruments and you were like, I need cash now. You might sell it to somebody for a haircut and then the question is, later on, would those people, you know, there were people holding large masses of these bonds who hadn't been the people they had been originally, originally assigned to. Um, and there's a really interesting book, which is now, it's been sort of like the subject of a lot of criticism, but when it was originally published, James, uh, not James, Beard's uh, Economic uh, Interpretation of the U.S. Constitution, argued that a lot of what happened politically in the 10 or 15 years after the Revolutionary War was basically a matter of trying to organize the state on the, for the benefit of these bondholders in order to, I mean, in no small part, to try and keep the country solvent because, you know, they, they owed, I mean, this is the brilliance of Hamilton. I'll talk about this more when I, when I, do, when I do talk about Hamilton more extensively. Hamilton, Whatever else you could say about the guy, people are like, well, he does all these weird financial things. But Hamilton really understood how a financial economy worked. And he set up the country in such a way that our debts were being paid down uh, and, that, and that the country could run on a solvent basis, uh, even though at the end of the war, uh, once again, the United States government owed a fantastic amount of money to, to various creditors. So this is a kind of a remarkable thing. I mean, it's, it, it's interesting in the sense that it's an important precursor to the French Revolution, which will happen starting in 1789. But it's very different, too. The French Revolution is very much about, let's kind of break things down to the ground and start. Those of you who know about the French Revolution will recall that they, start, they restart the calendar. They start with the year one. And that tells you something, you know. When you're rejigging time like that, you're, you're really trying to kind of recreate society from its foundations. The, the colonial rebels and the, the colonists, most of them at the beginning didn't necessarily want a separate country. A lot of them continued to believe through much of the war, and the loyalists all thought. What, they, what was going on was a fight for the liberties that were due to Englishmen. And that the English system was not necessarily bad. I mean, Alexander Hamilton certainly didn't think it was. 
Jefferson was a bit more jaundiced about it, and a lot of those guys down in Virginia, the plantation owners were, but, but Hamilton really thought, this is a right system of government, if we could just make it work right. And people kept thinking, people kept accusing Hamilton of wanting to set uh, whoever, sometimes Washington, sometimes himself, up as a kind of king. Because Hamilton uh, and a lot of the people around him were very sympathetic to the British way of doing things. And this is the fundamental thing to remember about, I mean, I shouldn't say the, this is one of the two fundamental things. One, what they're trying to do is take the British system and make it work right, make it work the way it's supposed to, make it work so that it guarantees the rights for individual, now let's just be clear, individual white men. Um, somebody, another one of my English, my U.S. history professors said, and uh, like I don't know enough about it to know whether this is the case, but just to sort of replay the comment, that uh, the only reason that they didn't make it illegal for non-whites to come here in the Constitution, because they never thought that they would want to do it, uh, or they, it never occurred to them. But in any case, I mean, so this is, a, this is a white male society. This is like not news to anybody sitting here, I'm sure. But, um, but what they want to do is take the British system <coughs> and either perfect it or make it work the way it itself is supposed to work, right? But the other interesting thing about it, too, is this idea that, uh, I mean, this is a novel moment in world history. Like, people aren't, like, setting up constitutions where everyone, not everyone, but where, like, the franchise is distributed as widely as it is. I mean, this is the difference between, okay, so there's a property franchise, but so lots of people, many, a much larger proportion of the people in North America actually meet the property franchise for voting than, than do in Great Britain. So this is a new situation, an idea that we're going to have uh, uh, leadership that's not hereditary. And as a matter of fact, like we're kind of allergic to the idea of an aristocracy. Some, you know, back during the kind of Bush years, people used to say, well, the Bush family is kind of an aristocracy. And that was a slam. And people took it seriously because we just don't like the idea. Uh, now, we do like the idea of, of being able to pass the, the things we make onto our children. But we don't like the idea of someone just being able to sort of walk into some position just because of who their father was. That kind of strikes us as Americans, I think. It, it, it runs against the grain, right? You know, you, there are these moments when it happens, and you think, well, geez, that's not, that's not really right. We want to run our, our affairs on a kind of merit basis. And we want to run our affairs in such a way that everybody gets a say. I believe that the, the, you know, there's that sort of moment, the Thomas Rainsborough moment from the Putney debates. I believe that the, the least he that is in England has a life to live and that he should not be constrained to obey a government that he himself hath not had a part in setting up. And so this is the establishment of a completely new political principle on the earth. It has precursors, especially in British society, but this is the dawning of a new age, and it's one that we're sort of playing out the consequences of even to this day. That's what I have, and I will take questions if you have them, and I also have pencils for people who just want to do the survey and leave. Feel free. How long did the Valley Archon last? Um, they were hunkered down there for about uh, a month before the real attack happened. And it was once again, like, the, uh, there was a lot of kind of discussion that went on. But the actual battle itself, like, the shooting part only took about two days. And it became clear, I mean, Cornwallis, I think, uh, realized relatively quickly that there was no way that they were going to be able to break out. And that after the Battle of the Capes had happened, there was no way he was going to be able to get resupplied. And so it wasn't a terribly costly battle uh, in terms of... Uh, in terms of casualties, but mostly because Cornwallis, I think, saw the writing on the wall fairly quickly. Uh, the naval part, how long did that last? Uh, that went on for at least three weeks. The first Battle of the Cape, I think, is right at the beginning of September, and then, um, but it's mostly, you know how it is with those naval battles, like they, like they're kind of circling around, like trying to get into the right, because, you know, to get a, to the, the sort of the whole operation to work properly, you have to be like organized with the wind properly. And, you know, if you know, um, like a reading of military history will sort of remind one that 
one of the things like commanders are often thinking about is like, I don't want to fight this battle necessarily if I don't have to because I want to make sure I can fight it on the terms that I want to fight it on. So that by the time the first Battle of the Cape happened, uh, the British, who were rather outgunned, thought this is going to be our best opportunity. We're going to have to do this now uh, because things are, are, are breaking down on the James Peninsula in a way that the York James Peninsula, in a way that's not going to be uh, that's not going to be sustainable for more than a few weeks at this point. So the whole, the end of the war in Virginia comes down relatively quickly uh, in the end, in the sort of fall of 1781. Um, but once they get up into Virginia like that, the die is really cast. Like once they get out on the York James Peninsula, there's no, uh, I mean, once again, McClellan was only able to sort of rectify his foolish endeavors on the York James Peninsula because at that point the, the U.S. Navy had uh, superiority of the seas and could evacuate his troops up to Fortress Monroe or to, where, to wherever off the, off the coast. Yes? Um, in your reading or study, did uh, you find anything that corroborates the story that Cornwallis' troops, when they were in South Carolina and Georgia, picked up quinine? Uh, oh, right. Uh, Malaria. Um, yeah, there, actually, there was both sides suffered heavily from malaria. There were parts of uh, Southside Virginia. I, I used to work at the Southern Historical Collection at the University of North Carolina, and I was re I was doing a collection of letters <coughs> from the late nineteenth century about, and it was from a from a guy who had been involved in railroad building, and they were talking about the parts of Southside Virginia that you still couldn't build into because they were malarial. So there was there was actually fairly severe disease. Uh, prob and the, the 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 fighting in the in the southern theater was much different too because they didn't stop for the winter like they they did that stuff year round, um, but yeah they they suffered pretty severely from well, from troops aren't able to fight. right yeah 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 and that probably contributed a lot I mean there was a lot of attrition just from being down that way also he got down there and just to sort of like extend on something I said earlier discovered that the uh, potential for loyalist groundswell was not quite what he had hoped it was going to be. And so that, you know, he then found himself in a very hostile environment and in a place where, you know, if you're up in the, up on the Atlantic seaboard or up in New England, you can get resupplied from Canada. If you're down in the, in the, in the Carolinas, resupply is a much more difficult proposition because you're further from the from the Army's central bases of operation. So, um, uh, yeah, I think disease was a major factor in, in the attrition and also poor supply lines as well. The movie The Patriot, um, at the end of the movie, I don't know if you saw it or not. I did. Okay, a while back. Yeah. But uh, at the end of there's a battle. Was that the Battle of Cowpens? I think it was the Battle of Cowpens. All right, well, thank you so much for coming out, and I hope to see you again when I talk about the Constitution in July. Thank you so much.